I have with me today, David Kraft. David Kraft, his mission is to help business leaders improve the health of their organization. So David, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first and what's your background? All right, well, um, I'm looking forward to this time together, Greg. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My, uh, my grandfather actually was an executive in Kansas City and um, he vacationed here in West Central Florida. And um, ultimately he, um, he, he bought the little Gulfside Motel that he vacationed in. Um, so you know, I don't know whether he was expecting that to be somewhat vacation-like or if he really, I'm not sure what he was thinking it was going to be like, but um, he, uh, I always tell people it was a brilliant move because he had four teenagers that were all too, uh, all old enough to work, but uh, too young to leave. Uh, so he 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 kind of came with an army of help uh, into this little this little uh, old school fifties style Gulfside motel. So it had always been his dream to own his own business, and he had been working very hard um, over the previous like ten to twenty years to to position himself to do that. He truly believed that the best way to do that in most cases was to buy cash flow that was existing, uh, which actually tracks a lot with franchising. It's basically buying a system that's already proven. Um, so, you know, he, he, he wasn't, uh, he was entrepreneurial, but he wasn't a startup kind of guy. He was the kind of person that would, you know, was looking for something that had some established um, uh, validity, um, you know, more proof of concept market, that type of thing. So, um, so they moved here. Uh, this, this was before I was born, obviously. And uh, but over the coming years, my dad and my uncle, one of my uncles, um, became quite enthralled with the concept of this business, you know, entrepreneurship piece. Uh, as they grew into young men, they joined my grandfather in various different types of businesses. Uh, matter of fact, my dad's primary um, uh, uh, role in their partnership was to locate the next business opportunity for them to consider. So, uh, of course, this was way pre the internet. So that was going through brokers' ads in mag in uh, magazines and newspapers and building relationships with uh, with the business brokers in the area to uh, you know to have a deal flow coming for different businesses that they could potentially get into. And it led them to being in, in businesses that were kind of across the indus, industry gamut. So there was some hospitality, there was some uh, retail, some real estate, uh, some development, um, some manufacturing. Uh, and, you know, it, it was so it was just kind of broad scope across a lot of industries. Um, and I went to work in um, one of the businesses as a late in my late teens, about 15, 16 years old. And um, I started working there in the, in the labor component, which kind of surprised me. I thought I would be working in the office somehow, um, but I was instead building, uh, building wood privacy fence in a, in a pole barn in Florida. Um, so yeah, that was a, it's just, it was a sweaty mess, but I'm working alongside some, some folks out there that are, you know, they're like me, they're, they're, we're cutting parts and putting stuff together. And I'm, and I'm, I'm hearing things like little, like little murmurings, little grumblings around. And they're saying things about the management, the leadership of the business, which it actually took me a minute, to be honest, to put it together that they were talking about my family. And then I was like, well, wait a second, you know, my family are, you know, they're good people. Like, this doesn't sound accurate by my view. So then I would spend some time in the office or we would spend some time uh, that we had a pretty hard family rule. We didn't talk about business when we were not at work. So my family didn't really take it home and talk about it there. I never remember hearing any real discussion of work issues or whatever at home. But I spent some time in the office on my breaks and my lunch. And I would hear things in discussion with my dad, my grandfather and my uncle. And they were kind of grumbling and whining and moaning about the people that I was working with. So there was, there was this dynamic at play, but here's the thing, each side kind of had some valid points and each side cared about things that the other side didn't think they cared about. Um, 
for instance, uh, uh, I have a situation one year uh, near Christmas time where I was exposed to some discussion in the yard about, you know, how much the management leadership might not care about, you know, the team at Christmas time. And then I go up front and it hadn't been a particularly great year. And I hear people talking about, and then I hear my, my family talking about how they're going to work Christmas bonuses and how they want to do something, but they're trying to figure out how, you know, what to do and how much to do. And because it was, it was a lean, it was a lean situation. So I'm thinking, okay, there's a gap here. Um, there's a gap in communication, certainly, but there's also a loss in that there's good ideas that are being floated on both of these, in, in both of these pockets. There's some great information that's not getting to the management about how the, the functions of what we do could be done potentially better because the team doesn't believe they care. And then there's some great um, desire, probably would be a good way to put it, on the part of the management and leadership of the company to uh, take care of the team in a way that they don't really necessarily believe the team, you know, the, the, the team doesn't necessarily believe that they, that they want to care for them in that way. So there's a gap. So I just kind of noted it. But over the course of the coming years, as I began to work for other companies and then and then later work also with my dad and my brother, we took it down a generation and started doing kind of some of the same things. Um, I began to, uh, you know, I was I was always kind of sensitive to this dynamic, like how much of a gap is there in this organization or, you know, or, or whatever. And then when I reached the point where I was actually starting to be, um, you know, in a supervisory or managerial type role or ownership role, I actually had quite a, a, a concern. I, 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 I was kind of terrified that people were talking more uh, about me than to me. Um, so I, you know, tracking back to the gap, I was like, I, I don't want a gap, or at least I don't want the gap to be any larger than it absolutely must be. I want I want to know what the team actually does think, even if it's painful, even if it's difficult, even if it's messy. And of course, human communication probably always will include those things. So, um, so I started looking at ways to do that, like ways to create a safe space, ways to kind of tools, basically just, but I needed something simple because these are small businesses, right? And I'm not working in, you know, 500, 700 employee companies where, uh, I, I can I can create a real uh, heavy system for how to do all this. It's got to be agile and relatively straightforward. Um, so I started kind of developing those tools and just implementing them as a manager, just using you know them to try to make sure that people were talking to me, um, and uh, and then I would try to feed that take that feedback from them and then feed it back into the organizational processes of the business so that it kind of became a circle. So um, that's kind of the genesis, if you will, of, 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 of you know, the, my, you know, like, like, like my work background and then the gap and then, you know, kind of the, the early, if you will, the early phases of uh, the connective workplace, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Perfect. Well, it sounds like your firm must be multidisciplinary then. So do you have a sweet spot uh, that you like to work with? Absolutely. Um, my personal professional, if you will, pers personal professional, all of it really is the sweet spot for me is, um, is organizational health. And so it's taking care of the people on both sides of the ball. So you've got the management and leadership side. And we have a job to do as managers and leaders and, and, um, and, and business owners. And uh, we're conscious of that, more conscious than others in, in our business. And we're always conscious of the fact that we're more conscious of that. <laughs> so we're, uh, you know, I, I hear business owners all the time. They say, well, I just say, I wish I think, I, they, don't, they, they, they don't think the same way. I wish I could get someone so to think like this or think like that. Well, the reality is that there's some of that that can be accomplished through good leadership, but at the same time, there's also some benefit that is being missed 
in actually absorbing the way that that, that that team member or that group or whatever is seeing things. In other words, their perspective, their unique perspective, I call it their voice, their unique voice is valuable actually to the organization. A lot of times it's where innovation comes from. It's where better ways of doing things come from, better processes, whatever. So my sweet spot is basically the people part of this equation. How do we work together to bring all of that collective value to bear in the organization in a way that's useful, but again, agile? We can't collaborate on every single minutia you know, uh, of, of, of daily activity, but we can collect data from everyone and then use that data to drive organizational health and improvements. So, you know, I think, um, I, I'm trying to remember, I think I might've mentioned this to you when we talked um, not too long ago. Uh, I always get a kick out of, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a number of groups on employee engagement and, um, I always get a kick out of watching leaders, managers, owners go to these, these groups and say things like, I need ideas for employee engagement. And I always think you're asking people who have no exposure whatsoever to your company culture, your region, your team, the, 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 uh, the, the various um, ethnic groups that might exist in your team they have no framework, no context whatsoever for answering that question. Any answer they would give would be like literally just like a dart at a board after you've been spun around with a blindfold on. Um, ask the team. That's how you find out how to engage them. You talk with them. So, so my sweet spot is, is, is this people piece. It's, it's, it's connecting these dots, if you will, and, and, and making it a circle so that you're bringing in information and then that information then is used to create change and, 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 and thereby improve health in the organization. So it makes a circle. Perfect, yep. Gotta know, uh, gotta know what your people want and uh, as much as you can work with them to, to get drive them towards a common goal. Good this goal. is it, this is totally it. So you and I had a conversation about uh, labor issues facing U.S. businesses and even more specifically franchise owners. Uh, what do you see happening in the in the workforce right now? OK, so <clears throat> I am, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have uh, I have a lot of workforce related exposure. I've been on my local workforce board for almost 10 years. Um, a few years ago when OK, so it, as we entered the beginning of 2020, pre-COVID, uh, unemployment numbers were extremely low, which we were considered to be at nationally at what they call full employment, which is essentially everybody that's work with it wants to work is working. Um, as a matter of fact, even pre-COVID, there's a statistic out there, um, and this next piece is gonna be very data heavy. All of this data is available. Um, uh, from me, I have, uh, I actually have a private Facebook group and then I also have some other resources. So um, I'm going to hit this, I'm going to skim very high points, but there's tons of additional research and data that's underneath this, kind of like a, uh, a, an, an iceberg floating. Um, so we're going to hit the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot underneath it. So <clears throat> in the early part of 2020, before COVID kicked off, there was a statistic floating out there that said 70% of businesses were already struggling with a shortage on labor. They were having trouble getting the people that they needed to continue their growth. Then COVID hit. <clears throat> and that became, uh, to use the terms <clears throat> from one of these reports from uh, uh, an organization called MZ, um, to use their term, that became an accelerant on the already present problem of the labor shortage. Um, I wasn't really paying attention, to be honest, in that first half of 2020. I, I just assumed that, that, that when we, so when we, we started to try to kind of open things up in the third and fourth quarters of 2020, um, there was definitely a shortage. 
I made the assumption that most of the shortage was lying on the fact that that there were federal um, bonuses, if you will, on top of state unemployment compensation that were making it difficult for some folks to really consider going back to work, um, perhaps in positions that paid even less than they were getting on unemployment compensation. Made sense to me. I mean, I can understand someone not wanting to work if they are going to make less money than they would make if they stayed home. Uh, unfortunately, the research and the data has has brought a tremendously different picture than that. Uh, and as I've been uh, involved in looking at that data, um, there's a multi-faceted uh, and protracted, or at least projected to be a protracted issue that's taking place in the U.S. labor markets. Um, and so, you know, just to hit a couple quick data points, um, baby boomers are retiring at more than twice the pace that they were only a few years ago, um, over 3 million a year versus 2 million a year. That's, a, that's a, a million additional people leaving the workforce at an accelerated rate. The um, birth rate since 1960 has been falling in, in the U.S. The um, over 2 million females left the workforce during the COVID pandemic. It was like a February, February 2020 to February 2021 kind of time frame on that statistic. Um, there's been an, a, a slow but a steady drop in labor force participation rates for eligible males since 1980. Um, so these are big scope issues, not small ones. It's not just that the federal government was giving out a little extra money and people stayed home. We actually have a genuine, a genuine labor shortage that's kind of shaping up. They're calling it the great resignation, the big quit, the, you know, I saw another one the other day, some, somebody else had a new term for it, but, um, but it's a big deal. People are really transitioning um, out of the workforce and the workforce is shrinking is probably a better way to put that. Um, so the statistics that are the most specific for franchises and really anybody with a labor component that needs to be addressed with people who will actually be somewhere and do something physically um, I want to pull a little data from a recent segment from 60 Minutes. That's actually the, 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 where the big quit, uh, where it was called the big quit, uh, was their, their lead segment just a few weeks ago uh, here in the first quarter of uh, 2022. And they, uh, they had Karen Kimbrough, who's the lead uh, chief economist for LinkedIn, on talking with uh, them about what she's seeing in the labor markets. And she gave this statistic, and this is, this is, this is very powerful. She said, pre-pandemic, one, one in 67 positions was remote. Today, one in seven positions is remote. So to say that there's a significant shift toward uh, remote work, not that anyone's surprised, but that's a pretty significant number. Um, so what we're seeing, uh, so then she went on to share an infographic showing the four industries or four sectors, probably be a better way to put it, that are showing some of the worst, you know, like the most openings, job openings. And not surprisingly, these were in hospitality, like restaurants and hotels, uh, educa uh, education, uh, medical, and retail. These are all areas where people have to uh, show up and do the thing. They can't. They can't do. And, and I, you know, also we're seeing it at trench level with construction and some other trades. You can't build a house. You can't serve food remote. The the so the labor. So what's happening in these markets is there's a transition of labor from working in person to working remote. It's like there's a labor demand for the remote style positions, which is leaving even bigger gaps in the positions that you would need to fill to run most franchises 
um, that have a labor component and need to fill, need people to show up every day and do that job, do the thing, whatever that might be. So um, it's making an already broad scope problem, a narrow scope, uh, you know, an increasing challenge for on the narrow scope for franchises. Gotcha. Okay. But you help people with that. You help people bring in their their people, keep the people there longer, and find those people that need to work work for them. So you make it easier on them. We'll see you. Got so there's a multi generational workforce out there right now. Uh, even though we still have uh, we have the baby boomers moving out and moving on, we still have we have people from all generations out there. What are your thoughts on on doing on working with the multi generational workforce? Yes. So. The this kind of tracks back to the people component we talked about a few minutes ago with with um, you know my sweet spot in 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 bringing parties together so that they're actually using the full power if you will of all of the generations so you have four four generations essentially that are meaningfully contributing to the workforce right now you have baby boomers you have Generation X you have millennials and you have Generation Z. So um, <clears throat> for short, boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. <laughs> so each one of these uh, uh, generations, though they tend to feud more than they collaborate, they do have really solid complementary pieces that, that when, they, when they get an opportunity where they feel they do have safe communication, they can pull together solutions, innovate, uh, grow, um, uh, brainstorm, solve problems at rates that no single one of them could accomplish. The key is essentially in creating a simple system for them to do that. This is where the connected workplace basically, this is, this is, this is the meat, if you will, of the connected workplace for the generational piece right now. Um, the goal of the connective workplace is to create an environment where every voice is pursued, where every um, input is considered. It may not be acted upon, but the action of consideration is what gives the value to the team member that brought it. The, um, these things are then brought into a, a, a focus there looked at and then there's an output so essentially it works its way from a, a you know information gathering we call that the connective review to information uh, analysis to uh, information um, to, to, to data output which would be we call it the connective blueprint so essentially you build a blueprint then for your organization to improve um, th these improvements um, could be health uh, organizational health or they can be operational. In most cases, they're both. Matter of fact, in all cases, they have been both. So the, the, the goal is essentially to create an, uh, or to provide, the connective workplace is providing a simple set of tools that, that the generations can all use to pull the value that each brings into a mix and then create a, a straightforward, agile output of that so that the organization can use it. Um, obviously data collected is not super useful. This is why the old school suggestion box is kind of a funny thing because people always assume that, that their suggestion goes in the suggestion box, they never hear anything else about it. Sometimes the suggestion sits in the suggestion box for three years. Nobody even knew there was anything in the box. Nobody's checking the suggestion box. <laughs> so. The connective workplace is an organic and dynamic flow that's in a constant state of pursuing the voice, then reading that information, reading that feedback, and then producing a result of a blueprint toward a future, you know, toward future changes. Um, it's all basically based around the connective review, which is a three question survey. Um, it's what do you love about your job here? What do you hate about your job here? What would you do differently if you were in charge? And those three simple questions with no context given produce a broad range of results 
and a tremendous insight into, you know, again, you want to know what your team, what would engage your team, ask them some open-ended questions like those. They will tell you. Some people will say, you know, I think that we are, you know, we look stupid in the market. I think our marketing materials are crap. They should be redone. They're old. They're this or that. And other people will be like, I just wish we had Snickers in the snack machine. Um, or I just wish we had a snack machine. <laughs> there you go. All of this information is valuable. Right. So, and any action that's taken on it directly engages the team because they're looking at it saying, hey, they asked, we spoke, they listened, we're a team. That's how a team works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so a lot of companies bandy about the term team but they don't actually work there um so so yes yeah, so the connective workplace is basically a set of tools that simplifies the process makes it easy uh, and and straightforward and very tangible it's very it's obvious there's like an accountability piece to it in that our team uh monitors the 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 whether or not it's being done which is the key accountability component as long as the process is being worked then the process itself is 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 self-sufficient um but uh it's it's a visible um accountable communication system um to help basically create an environment this is what creates the culture that allows you to retain people when it's difficult to retain them. People are talking all the time that they don't leave that they that they leave managers. The statistics are are strong that people do not leave the money. They don't leave the job most times. They leave the management. And so if you can create an environment where they feel valued, where their voice is pursued, where they feel inspired by who they work with and what they do. This is about the way they feel. It's not about their paycheck. It's not about their benefits. It's about how they feel about coming to work every day. When you create an environment and a culture that gives them that value, then your the, the loyalty piece, the retention piece, and the performance piece all win. So everyone, everyone wins. In a market like this, it becomes a humongous value proposition for your company, a competitive advantage in that you've created a culture where people want to be and where poaching would be poachers who would attempt to offer them an extra two dollars an hour to come work for them would have to equally compete with their pitch on why their business is has a culture of value and inclusion and 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 true equity amongst its its team uh and so this is the thing, the, the connective workplace is designed to help teams create that environment so that you can steal your loyalty and, and retain your team that you've got. And then, and then the connective workplace certification itself creates a competitive advantage for sourcing the additional recruiting the additional team that you would need. So can you unpack that a little, the, the connective workplace certification process? What are you talking about there? Absolutely. So. I, what, what I did basically is I took the tools that I had been using as a manager and then as a business owner and then uh, as a consultant um, where I've worked with a number of uh, both inside and outside the franchise world. Uh, so um, I have multi-store uh, franchise customers that have, have, have worked with these tools, effectively worked with them and, 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 and it's, it's been very good. And then I have uh, you know, across other industries, and and of course, franchises span various industries. So you've got kind of both components there, but um, both within and without the franchise world, the tools have been useful and effective. But essentially, the connective workplace is pulling together all of those tools that I that I put together over the years into a simple process. The process is we measure communication. That's step one. It's called the connect the connective assessment. Then we collect some data. That's called the connective review. That's the three question survey, which that survey actually 
serves as a drill down later for other functions. So you've got, what do you love about your job? What do you hate about your job? What would you do differently if you were in charge? You can also say, what did you love about this meeting? What did you hate about this meeting? What would you do differently if you were in charge? What, did, what do you love about this project? What, would you, what do you hate about this project? What would you do dif differently if you were in charge? There's all kinds of data collection points for the survey, but the main one is the one that's non-contextual. What do you love about this place? What do you hate about it? What would you do differently? Um, and then the third piece of that process is to pull that data together into, the way we do it is we pull that data into, together in, in numbers so that there's confidentiality, confidentiality involved in what the team says specifically and individually. But we look closely at what pings high percentages, things that are good, things that aren't so good, things that the team would suggest to improve. And then it's that data that creates the framework for the connective blueprint, which is the blueprint for organizational improvement per the collective, the total group, the total group opinion, if you will. Um, so the group has weighed in, the data has been compiled. You're looking at maybe 70% of the team says Snickers should be in the snack machine or 70% of the team says they should have a snack machine. That's a no brainer. Go get a snack machine and get Snickers in there. Um, you know, there may be some more complicated ones, but what I find is that there's a high percentage of actionable items that come from these blueprints. And so, and a lot of times the, the management or leadership's like, that's all they want. Like that's all that, 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 that's all they said, you know, we needed to work on or that's, but the magic of working on that is the magic of the connected workplace. It, drew, it, 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 it draws that connection into the group and the connection is what steals the loyalty. So, so that's, that's the process. Well, that's perfect. So while all the other businesses, whether they be franchises or private owned businesses are having problems with getting workers, retaining workers, if people come see you, you can help them solve that problem. So you'll be the one with all the workers and your competition will be the ones without the workers. Go see David. They will make certain that those workers want to stay there, want to work with you, tell their friends about you so that you've got an endless supply of workers. David, how do people get in touch with you? All right. So the best way to get in touch is going to be through uh, email. And that's going to be info at connectiveworkplace.com. So info at connectiveworkplace.com. And um, of course, I'll, 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 I can also give you our, our, our main number. It's 941-877-2081. We can actually receive messages and calls, of course, there. So um, you can reach out by either of those methods. And um, we, are, we, we are excited always to talk with teams um, because again, this goes back to what my sweet spot is and, and, and my fulfillment piece. I love this stuff, as you can tell. Um, and I have a genuine desire to see people happy at work um, and teams that are really leveraging and harnessing the true power of the collective that's present. And um, hence, hence my development of these tools. There you go. And then you now all the people that need employees have one less thing to worry about, and that's keeping employees around and attracting new ones. Exactly. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. David, thank you very much for your time and all that information today. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Appreciate it.